So can you now see the slides? Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Thanks, Roland. Great. So welcome everybody. Great to see you again. If this is one of your repeat visits and if you're new, welcome. So these webinars are aimed for helping people who are working in education, particularly people who are leading schools, colleges, universities, but educators all around, to try and help people become data aware, to become in a position to look at their institutions through an AI and data lens, so that then they can leverage AI more appropriately to meet the big challenges that they face. And so today I'm going to be talking about step four, but I will contextualize it in the previous steps if you're new. And of course, all the previous webinars are available on our website for anybody who'd like to have a catch up. And this is very much about, as Roland said, thinking about what data you might want to collect to address the challenge that you identified at step two and to complement the data that you've already got and that you pulled together in step three. This is very, very practical, what we're talking about here. So I'm going to talk about data collection methods and I'm going to discuss the practicalities of those data collection methods today. And as always, through these webinars, I'll prompt you to, to think in this data and AI way, through a data and AI lens, so that you can develop a data, an AI mindset. And I find it really interesting that even in organizations where they have data science and AI expertise, it's often still only applied within the narrow space that those particular people work, rather than being used to try and help a whole institution or a part of an institution apply those methods to really understand the challenges that they face and, and how to address those challenges. And I'm really delighted today to have Bob Harrison, as Roland said, who's Chair of Governors at Northern College for Adults in Barnsley, and he's been a college principal and is also a school governor. So over the weeks, we're pulling in different parts of the education um, space. So we had Karine George, a, a primary head teacher, an advisor join us previously and, and the guest who comes in is really it's far the most interesting part of the of the presentation because they talk about the issues they face and we try and contextualize what I've been saying for the kind of people they represent so the sorts of people who are working in further education but in education generally as well okay so who are we we've got a new member so yay there's another name on the slide this week so Welcome to our, to our team, Ibrahim Bashir. So he's a new who's joined us recently. But as ever, otherwise we are Carmel Kent, uh, Mohammed Ali Chaudhry, Maluka Grover, myself, Rose Larkin, Anis Mwani, and Bandule. And all of us have a background in data science, artificial intelligence, education. Uh, that's what we love doing. But this is all about helping other people understand enough about data and AI to really leverage AI to tackle some of the big educational challenges that we face. And we take you through a seven step process to what we call AI readiness. And we've already done steps one, two and three. So we've looked at how you need to bring your whole community on board so that they understand why you might be going to change the way things work in your organization in order to leverage data and AI. We've looked at how you can pick specific challenges that you want to focus on when you're looking to see how you can leverage data, data science, and then AI. And we've looked at how you can identify the kind of data that you already have. And sometimes people have data, data they don't realize they have because we've encouraged you to look very broadly, for example, at the physical environment, as well as data that you might have about the results of assessments. So today it's all about collecting new data because you may not have enough data to really understand the challenges that you're facing and then to see how you could use AI to address those challenges. So today it's about collection. So collecting new data relevant to the focus that you've chosen. And of course, I can't go through one of these sessions without also reminding you that our perspective on artificial intelligence is one that's very much about stressing the rich diversity of human intelligence 
and the fact that artificial intelligence is not the same as human intelligence and that our own human intelligence is much richer, much complex than anything AI can offer at the moment. In particular, in the way that we can look at our own intelligence, look at our own thinking, look at our own emotional development through these meta intelligences, which no AI can do at the moment. So it's all about helping to see how AI and human intelligence work together for the benefit of teaching and learning. So let's talk about data. Now, two weeks ago or two sessions ago, uh, we talked about some of the problems facing higher education in a post um, pandemic or rather in a COVID compliance, because I don't think the pandemic is in the past yet, but the, the kinds of challenges that we're facing uh, higher education. And one of the challenges that we picked out to have a look at was continuity of teaching and maintaining quality and standards. And at step two, we introduced these 10 criteria that you could use to decide between different challenges you were facing, to decide where you want to focus your attention because you can't look at all the challenges necessarily at the same time. So we use these 10 steps, these 10 criteria to identify sorts of challenges that educational organizations are facing that are amenable to the process that we're proposing. And we started when we were thinking about what data you might have to look at a whole range of different sorts of data. And in particular, we drew attention to the sorts of data that are perhaps slightly different to those that you might naturally think about. So yes, we often think about surveys and interviews, but we can also collect multimodal data about how people's faces are changing, how they're moving. There's lots of different sorts of data that it's possible for us to collect and for us to analyze. So what other data could we collect well, I love this little cartoon, which uh, one of my colleagues pointed me towards, because actually credibility is really important. We want to make sure that our data is accurate and it is credible, because that's important when it comes to getting accuracy out of the analysis that we do of the data that we collect. And I also think one area that's often overlooked is what other people have done. You know, what kind of data have other people already collected about one of the challenges that you're facing and reported about? And so there are various different resources that are worth looking at. And I've only picked three resources here um, because I know money is tight. So we've got open knowledge maps and we've got digital promise research maps that can help you identify what sorts of research has been done. So you can see if the kind of challenging challenging the kind of challenge you are facing is one that's already um, been subject to, to attention that might be useful that might save you some time and again institute for education sciences john hopkins university education endowment foundation in the uk educause lots of sources where you can access useful research freely but to our problem for today you've identified that you don't have enough data so what key considerations should you take into account when you're planning the collection of new data to complement the data that you already have? Well, you need to make sure that your data addresses the challenge that you've already identified and that it doesn't repeat the data that you've already collected unless there's a good reason for repeating collection of that data. So, for example, if the data set that you've got is inconsistent or incomplete or gathered at too many different times for it to be useful, you might do some repeating. But what you really want to do is, is find new data to complement what you already have. So if we think about that challenge in higher education, about continuity of teaching, which was just one part of that bigger challenge of, of maintaining quality and standards as well, which obviously we want to do. Um, but thinking about maintaining quality of teaching and continuity of that quality. So we may have data already about the staff who are delivering um, the material. And let's say it's remote at the moment because that's what's happening in all of higher education. And we may already have data about the courses they've taught before. We may have data about 
how students have or have not been successful with the different elements of this court. We'll go this course, we'll have assessment data about those individuals. We may or may not have rich data about the individuals taking that course, probably not. So we might want to think of something different um, as a complement to that data. And it might be that that fresh data that we'll collect is actually something we're going to do actively with students who are taking the course or actively with tutors, lecturers who are giving the course. Or we may decide that there's something we can collect automatically as teachers are using remote tools to teach their students. You need to work out who's going to have responsibility for gathering the data because it might not be you if you're a school leader college leader you know who are you going to make responsible for gathering that data when are you going to get that data gathered i mean a very interesting uh, data collection exercise that we are doing at the moment as a team is through our schools based survey that we've been doing through a question a day for the last few months and we were talking this morning about the need for us to think that the end of term is coming for schools and that's a point where we need to uh, make sure that we've gathered the data that we need before term ends but also think about ways that we might continue into the vacation so what are the key time frames for your collection and you've got an urgent problem you might need to collect that data urgently but perhaps you can also think of longer term data collection that will continue to complement what you already know how will the data be gathered, transferred and stored? Storing data safely, of course, is incredibly important. And as you know, the acronym for our seven steps is ethical quite deliberately, so that we're constantly ensuring that we're behaving ethically. What format are the data required in? It might be that it's text or numbers or audio recording or video recording or log data. What's the format? And as I say, ethical issues, do you have permission to collect and use the data from the people whose data it is? Fundamentally important. So what type of data collection should you conduct at this point in time? Now, if you remember one of the other issues that we've looked at previously was about getting the A team into your business or into your school or college or particular um, course team you know and then maintaining the best staff making sure that, that they feel they're working in a positive culture and, and assuring that their well-being physical and psychological and we thought about the kind of data that we might already have the data that, that, that we might have might consist of interviews perhaps when the person was appointed we could have done a staff survey have a staff record card and there's probably something around um, performance review but obviously we have to be very careful about these things so think about where your existing data is and then think well how complete is this data you know was it collected in a consistent manner um, did the process change so for example with interview data as staff are appointed did we change the recruitment process last year the year before which means the data is inconsistent um, do we have a complete set or are there some gaps that we need to fill or would we be better to conduct a whole new data collection for that type of data now i'm going to go into a little bit more detail about two straightforward or seemingly straightforward sorts of data collection that i think are, are ones that we often consider and that is surveys and interviews because i think people often see these as very useful and they are but perhaps underestimate that the that they're quite complex forms of data collection and we need to think carefully before we go about um, using them so remembering that a survey is about gathering a range of individuals the same questions that are related to their characteristics attributes how they live their opinions now it can be very cost effective in terms of reaching a large number of people um, and it can be reliable if the questions are well designed and we make sure that we, for example, minimize the risk of bias. So we don't want to ask leading questions, which I'll come to in a minute. 
Um, an online survey, survey can be very effective and one can make it very uh, totally anonymous. Of course, there's then an issue about whether you know enough about the people who have um, completed the survey in terms of the demographics of those individuals to know whether they're representative and whether they, when you say have got 50% of your staff have answered the survey, do you know how representative that 50% are? But obviously anonymity is extremely important. And you can ask open-ended questions or closed questions, uh, depending on what kind of responses you want and how much time and energy and resource you have for the analysis. So open questions allow people a much freer um, way of answering. So if you're doing a survey and you're using an online survey and people are answering text, you let them enter free text as opposed to making them pick from multiple choice questions, for example. And as I was saying earlier, we can underestimate the complexity of this kind of activity because actually social science surveying is a specialist activity. So you need to think about whether you are wanting to use descriptive or explanatory um, questions. So you can use surveys, for example, to describe a particular population or to explain the kinds of things that we do with population census, for example, is very much looking to describe. Um, and you can look for trends in data to see how things change over time, whereby you might have a panel of people who complete the same survey at time one, time two, a couple of months later, time three, a couple of months later after that. And you can certainly have surveys that are self-administered through, for example, an online survey where somebody does it in their own time and at their own speed. And you could alternatively have the kind of survey where it's, it's, it's administered by somebody who talks the person through the survey. And that way, the timing is much more in the control of the person asking the questions. As I said, you can have open-ended or closed-ended questions. You can ask yes or no, you can ask agree or disagree, you can have people filling in the blanks, choosing from a list or a matrix, ranking things in order, top being the things that they believe to be the most true or reflect their preferences most truly, um, and so on and so on. So there's lots of different options and we need to be careful about how we go about this as we're designing our survey to make sure that we get the information that we want and that it's truly representative. So, for example, we could ask factual questions, which would give us, you know, systematic information. We could ask knowledge questions to find out whether people know something about a particular topic or not. Are they aware of something that's been happening and, and, and what is their knowledge of something? So for example, we could ask people in the current situation what their knowledge of the government regulations are about school reopening in September. Um, that would be asking them knowledge questions. We could ask attitudinal questions um, where we're trying to find out their opinions. So then we might be asking how they, whether they believe the measures um, being put in place by the government are sufficient or sensible or however we decide to word the question. And we need to be careful about the wording, which I'll come to in the next slide. We could ask behavioural questions, finding out what people do or they intend to do um, and whether that might have changed due to some kind of intervention, an intervention that we've made or something that's happened. So, for example, we might be asking people about whether they intend to use a particular sort of technology during the lockdown. And we could have asked that question um, at the beginning of the lockdown and we might ask it again later and, and it's, it would be interesting to see um, if, if they have indeed seen that behaviour through. And we could ask them what the consequences of that behaviour they believe will be true after they've behaved in this particular way. And we can ask preference questions. We can ask people you know, to, to, to select from a set of options according to their preference. Um, and those kinds of questions are quite useful for deciding, deciding whether there's a, um, a particular preference amongst a group of individuals for a way forward. So if we go back to thinking about continuity of teaching, and we were talking to teachers surveying the teachers who were involved in teaching the courses, then 
we might want to find out what their preferences are and then why they have particular preferences for behaving with their students in a particular way. And as I said, the way we word the questions is really, really important. And so it's easy to inadvertently or indeed deliberately in some cases, um, make your questions ambiguous. So you really need to make sure that you word your questions carefully, that they're clear. So avoid complex terms, language, and particularly avoid specialist terminology unless the people that you are surveying have knowledge of that particular specialism. Um, avoid double negatives because they're very difficult for people to process as they're answering the question. So do you not believe, or do you not believe that we shouldn't do A, B or C? And double barreled questions are also best to avoid. Keep it simple, ask for one point. Don't try and string questions together. Really important to avoid biased leading or loading questions. So try and avoid what we might call ring true statements when it, it can appear as if you're stating something that's so obviously true and yet it may actually not be true in the mind of the person that you're surveying. So for example, this government has made a great job of tackling COVID-19 would be a, a statement that sounds like it's ringing true, but of course you could easily disagree with that. And the same, it, really this hard to disagree with statements is similar to the one that I've just given an example of. You're really trying to get at what the person you're surveying believes, not trying to persuade them of your particular view of, of the institution's view. So we avoid leading questions, try and be absolutely objective because you want to know the information from that individual if you really want to understand your challenge. And try to be careful not to make it difficult for the person to answer the survey question. So don't ask them to be able to recall some information that might have been given to them previously. Obviously avoid anything that might be offensive. Don't assume they have knowledge about a particular thing unless you know that they do. So for example, it would be perfectly reasonable to ask um, a number of head teachers or college leaders their views about current government guidance about how their institution should operate. Although I'm sure even they find it hard to come up to date, to keep up to date, but it might not be fair to ask parents or pupils um, who may not have that knowledge. And it'll be, it'll be careful to avoid unwarranted assumptions. So don't make assumptions about what people know, but don't make assumptions within your question that may not be true. So for example, if you are asking a, a, a whole group of head teachers in the example that I gave before, don't assume that all of them have been in the job for 10 years. Some of them might actually be much newer to the profession than that, despite the fact that they're a leader. And make sure that you include socially desirable questions. So it's something that we want to, to see in a, in a socially positive way. And we may not be able to get this new survey data from everybody we might want to. So in our example of continuity of teaching or in our example of trying to find out how our team are feeling in the current situation, when we're thinking about staff wellbeing, we might love to get everybody's view but perhaps that's not practical so we might decide to sample um, so that we take some of a sample of the people who we could be, be surveying so the, the, the teachers if we're looking at continuity of teachers employees if you're thinking about um, staff culture and well-being so we can have a random sample and the point about these kinds of samples is that you're using a system so that you're you try to get a representative sample you're not just picking randomly where you might be biased so we could use a, a random number generator on a computer for example to pick you know some kind of number um, and then we can relate in advance numbers to individuals and then we can see who is going to be picked we could do systematic sampling picking a wide range of people so people who fit into a particular category we could do stratified sampling or we could do cluster sampling where we have an individual and with them we look for their connections and we pick a cluster of people 
around that individual. Your choice depends on the questions that you're asking and what your desired result is, what you want to use this information for. And we could have non-random samples, that's also an option. We could hand pick people who we feel will have um, a good perspective, a knowledge of the subject that we're surveying about. We could do snowball sampling where we have one person feeding onto another person, onto another person. Or we could have self-selecting or volunteer sampling when we ask people to come forward and we work with those people who volunteer. So there's lots to take in there about surveying and it's important that you take your time as you're designing this data collection method. Now, secondly, I said I talk a little bit about interviewing and I'll keep this short because I want to get to have the conversation with Bob Harrison um, sooner rather than later. So interviewing again is a, is a very useful data collection method. It's something that's used widely. Um, it can involve you as the individual acting in the role of a researcher, asking um, open-ended questions, or it can be much more structured where you actually know precisely what you want to find out from the interviewee and you structure the interview rather than being led by what they say. It's certainly a lot more than just a conversation. And again, we must bear ethics in mind. We must make sure that we've asked the person's permission. If we want to record the interview, we must make sure we've asked that person's permission for the recording. And we must make sure that we reassure them about exactly why we're collecting the data and what is going to be done with it. We must get their informed consent. That's extremely important. Um, and just as, as an aside on that, to show how the current COVID situation may be causing some sensitivities in this area. I was speaking at the Westminster Forum this morning and the speaker before me was the head of education from Google. And I had noticed on the Oak Academy platform that is um, powered by Google, that there was a, um, a question that asked you how you were feeling and asked for emotional feedback as you were visiting the, the website, the platform for the resources that have been developed by Oak Academy. And I looked at the privacy statements on the website and there was nothing about how the data was going to be used. And there was a statement about the fact that the data would be made available to the person running the platform, i.e. Google. So somebody in the audience asked about data security and ethics. And we had an interesting discussion about the extent to which when we're clicking on the I feel anxious or I feel happy today, whether we really know what's happening to that data. And actually we didn't. And so it was an interesting conversation about how we need to really clarify why we're collecting data and what we're doing for it. So a little sidestep there into ethics, but an important one. So a few tips for effective interviewing. If you can do it face to face, obviously we're in a, in a socially distancing world, so that may not be practical, but if it is practical, swear on, face each other, good eye contact, really important. Open posture. You need to give the impression that you want to, to know what the person has to say without intimidating them. So a bit of a lean forward, but not too much. As I say, eye contact, but not in a starey, scary way. And relax. That's good advice for both participants. You want your person who's ask, answering the questions to be relaxed and you can help with that by being relaxed yourself. Agree the length of the interview in advance. Make sure you've got a quiet place so that you won't be interrupted. Have a backup plan in case your technology doesn't work. And that happens more times than one would like to countenance. Indicate that you're listening without interrupting. So with the absence of nonverbal cues, if you're using phone technology, you need to be more verbal, but you don't want to stop the flow of the interview. So you can make an, you know, a heart, great, good. Try not to interrupt the flow, but do make the flow, but do make sure that the person knows that you're listening. And concentration spans are shorter when you're using a phone interview. So listen carefully and respond, summarize and prompt to keep the person engaged. I'm talking about attention spans. I am going to be stopping shortly. So this is my last slide before we go into some questions and then a conversation with Bob. 
So you won't remember what has been said in the interview and you need to record it. So you need to think about recording and transcribing. So when you're recording your interview, obviously you need to get permission, um, but you need to make sure that you've got an audio recording device and preferably a backup, test it ahead. If it takes batteries, don't forget the batteries, it's really important. As I said, get participant permission, don't turn the device off too soon and save the recording to a secure location, making a backup. Now transcribing takes a long time. And by transcribing, I mean listening to the audio and then typing out what was said. But it may be that you don't need to transcribe the whole recording of the interview. You may need to sample, for example. You might want to decide what it is you want to note. So you may not need to transcribe to the level of detail where you've got pauses and laughter and coughs and hums. You might just want the words. And make sure you build in enough time if you are going to transcribe everything. A useful tip that we found is to have a structured transcription um, set where you've already structured the sorts of things that you want to be finding. Um, people's views, people's perspectives, how they're feeling. And so you can semi-analyze as you just transcribe. So you're entering text into perhaps two or three boxes as you go. But you need to think about the time involved in that. Right, I'm gonna stop. That was a lot about data collection. Um, and the, the important thing is about complementing the data that you've already collected and making sure that it helps you understand that challenge more. So Roland, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and um, come back to you and ask if there are any questions before I go on to have a conversation with Bob. Uh, just the one so far, Rose. Um, this, uh, this might be an interesting one. Um, what, um, what, what's your, what are your thoughts, Rose, on, the, um, on how AI could be leveraged to measure um, a person's intuition uh, in, in any kind of a... Uh, sort oh, of... that is such a good question. Yeah. Intuition. Well, first of all, this is sorry, it's for a bit of an academic answer. We'd have to define what yeah, we meant I'm by just, intuition. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to pick a definition and then say something about that. Um, so if I think about intuition, I, I could define intuition as being a sense of understanding that one already has about a subject. Uh, and it could be about a person. So for example, I might have an intuition that um, the people about the, the people on this, uh, on this webinar, um, I might use that in the way that I try and present the information. But it's a very much, it's a, it's a, it's a soft, it's a subtle concept which of course is very difficult to collect data, which is why it's such a good question. So I think you need to, first of all, you need to define what you mean by intuition. And your question was, could you use AI to collect that data? Yeah. I think that you could use multimodal data collection that might use some AI. So for example, you could use voice data and facial data to do some analysis um, of emotion combined with what the person is saying as they're talking. Um, as I say, you'd have to define very clearly what you meant by intuition and therefore what you were looking for. Mm -hmm. But the role of the AI in that could be to then do the analysis of that audio and video data, or it may not be video data, actually the audio data and the facial expression data. Um, using an algorithm that is designed according to what you're looking for because of the way you've defined, dis defined what you mean by intuition. So the answer is yes, but it's complicated and you'd need to be very, very clear about precisely what you meant by intuition. And the other thing I must just say about those sorts of data collection mechanisms, really ethics is incredibly important there. And so particularly when you're collecting audio data, don't forget that you might be collecting background data that you're not intending to collect, but could be there in the background that, that may make anonymity harder to achieve and may give you information that you don't want and, and perhaps you shouldn't have. Okay, I hope 
that gave some help for answer to that. Thanks. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, yeah, I was I was thinking measuring the sort of the confidence and the uncertainty of the, of the people. Um, so yeah, no, that's that's pretty much it for the questions for the time being. Um, so I've just uh, activated uh, Bob. So uh, when excellent. Good to have you there. activated, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> it, it gets it gets harder as you get older. <laughs> Bob, do you want to say a little bit about yourself and your roles within further education? Thank you, Roland. Um, and uh, then perhaps something about the sorts of challenges that, that yeah. you face or the institutions you work with face. Yeah, I'll, I'll set a bit of context for FE, but before, before I do that, I hope you'll uh, permit me just to say two things about something you've already said. One, about you said something about the question that you might ask about this government is making a good job about COVID. Uh, the, my question is, you know, have you been on drugs just before you started this? No, no, uh, obviously uh, that was... <laughs> yeah, thank you, Paul. <laughs> your, sense, your sense of irony gets stronger as you go on. And the second thing is, you, you mentioned Oak National, and uh, I've got very strong views about Oak National uh, at a number of levels. I just wanted to, to say this, get it out of the way. I've talked to two people, two professors of education, well, I've talked to a few, but I've talked to two professors of education who you, you'd respect because of their work on online learning uh, over 30 years, both in the public and the private sector, and asked for their views about Oak National. And uh, the first one was, it's appalling. And the second one was, it set online learning back 30 years. And I think, uh, just, just to get this out of the way, I think the, the, the major flaw, in apart from the process, the process was corrupt, well, put the process to one side. The major flaw is the inability to distinguish between online schooling, i.e. an assembly where the kids stand in front of a laptop at home and sing Gaudiama Sigito with the Archbishop of Canterbury, online teaching, which is video lessons, which can be useful, but, but talking head video lessons, and online learning. And you and I know that online learning is a unique combination of uh, collaboration, communication, co-creativity, content, yes, content, but more about co-creation, community, compassion, uh, all those C, all those other Cs, and, and Oak National is just not that. So let's put that to one side. So further- but That actually is a great thing, because one of the challenges we face is how do you do online learning that has compassion, that is that all of the things that you've said are positive. But yeah, let's put that to one absolutely, side, but absolutely. that is a challenge. And those, and those skills are not necessarily transferable from a face-to-face -face context to- Yeah, to, to, absolutely. To, to you and I know. And I'm pleased the data point got brought up at your Westminster Forum this morning. I suspect, I know it was probably the person, Jen Person from Digital Divide, yeah. uh, Dig, Dig, Digital who brought it up because I've done a big web, I've done a big recording for her uh, because she's extremely worried about the GDPR implications of uh, Oak National. And uh, I added to that the story in the Times Ed today that's followed on from that question at your forum that you were this morning is that, um, you, you know, the, the owner, that's an interesting phrase, the owner of Oak National, you know, has said, yes, it's something that they're looking into, you know, about who controls all the data. Well, it's a bit late for that, seeing that there's, you know, I haven't Absolutely. Anyway, put that to one side. So further education. Well, you, you've got to go back to the turn of the century for, for the history of further education. Now, our further education colleges came out of the trade union movement. They came out of the Workers' Education Association. They came out of em employees, workers, miners, who would put a penny levy into the top of a can on a Friday night so they could build a school to teach their kids to read and write during the day and then to go and learn how to read and write in the night. So the whole history of further education comes out of an industrial era. And my thesis, and you've known this, you've heard me present this on a number of occasions, my thesis is those design principles which came out of a very mechanistic era are now no longer fit for purpose. And it's particularly ironic that you and I and others have been banging on about this for 20 odd years and with, with very little success or some success, you know, fell tag had a bit of success and e tag and so on. But a virus comes along and in the space of two months achieves much more of a paradigm shift than you and I and, and others have been spent most of our lifetime. So, as I said, the, the Buddhist in me 
it suggests as, as I get into my in my 70th year is that when I come back, I'll come back as a virus and then I can bring about change a lot bit quicker. So I, I've thought a lot about, I've, I've looked at your seven steps and I think they're entirely appropriate. I've, I've had a good look at those. I think you've got to look at further education at the moment in, in it, the context. It's currently yeah. been underfunded for 10 years at least. Uh, the government today have announced a, a, a multi-million pound package to fund capital expenditure but you and I know that that's not the issue really you know buildings aren't the issue I can't believe that you would want to build any more buildings that you what, what you want to be talking about is what's learning going to be looking like and what infrastructure do you need for learning and then ask the question what buildings do we need not the other way around but the the current context is it's been starved of money it's had a focus on buildings the digital infrastructure has been underinvested. The workforce capacity, capability, and competence has been uh, undermined over many years. And at the moment, the current data we collect tends to be around the wrong things. So we're doing a great job of collecting the wrong information because the information is predominantly around attendance, accountancy, accountability an assessment originally on my list i'd put achievement but it's not it's not even achievement yeah. it's assessment so so where, where we are where fe is in at the moment and if any of your your colleagues are thinking about ai and its applicability to fe it's absolutely right for it but we have to start at your first step i know on on this this webinar is about collect which is halfway down you know your fourth point We've got, uh, we've got colleagues who are still struggling with another eye. That's an interactive whiteboard. Yes. So, yes. so you know, we, we've got to start with where we're at, and that's got to be about raising awareness. I have absolutely no doubt that, you know, some of the photographs behind me of my grandchildren who were leaving school in the late 2030s, they will be using, the, you know, the, there'll be no books, there'll be no hard copy, there'll be no hard prints of 3D print. There'll be text to voice, voice to text, artificial intelligence, virtual reality, everything like that. The question, the challenge is how do we get from where we are now with the infrastructure and the work skills? And then how do we move it on to, 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 that, other, to, to, to that next plane? I've got, a, I've got a message to say my, my speaker's not working very well. I can hear you, Bob, but I don't know, but it, it breaks up a little bit, doesn't it? Yeah, it's. I think it's 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 fine. It's manageable. Yeah. Okay. Um, thanks, Roland. So thinking about that, Bob. So if we were to say, okay, you know, your college, the college that your chair of governors at, um, it's an outstanding and, college. Outstanding college. And taking an outstanding college, let's take the current situation. We've had the, we've had this lockdown. We've still got the pandemic. What are the what are your top two challenges that are bothering you and your governors? Not maybe for immediate solution, although I'm sure there are those, but maybe that need to be tackled in the next few months. Well, well, they are immediate, but they're also the next few months as yes. well. And and the issue is uh, about the sustainability and support from a transition from a predominantly face to face mode yeah. of delivery to one that is at the very least blended. And, and you know, th th it's been difficult for me because, you know, I was a principal, I retired as a principal. I've been a governor uh, for too many years now. I've been the chair of governors for five years. And the difficulty rose in being a governor is you're not the principal. So no. you can try and get the college to think about having a vision for the future. But at the end of the day, it, it's not your job. You, you can set a vision and you can set some KPIs. But it's been fairly frustrating for me because, you know, I've been singing this song since 2002 uh, and uh, uh, it's all right as having a digital strategy. But at the end of the day, unless the, the executive team and the management team buy into it. Then Which is why that step one is so important. Absolutely. You're absolutely right. OK, so were you to be the principal, what would you want to be tackling now? A couple of examples. Well, uh, the first thing that I would do, if, if, we, if we owned our own land and buildings, we, we don't. We, we uh, lease a 
grade one listed building, ironically, built out of the proceeds of slavery. The Earl of Stanmore uh, built the grade one listed building all those years ago. And it's really ironic and pleasing for me that we now run courses for victims of modern slavery. So there's a delicious irony for me in all there that. There. But, but for, for, for me, I think probably the first thing I would do, and, and I think this, this was brought home to me a couple of years ago, um, my mum my mom was very was dying in Rochdale. I live in South Manchester. And every day I would drive over and I'd drive past Trafford College here. And then I'd go past Hopwood Hall College, then I'd pass Rochdale Sixth Form College, and then finally Hopwood Hall College in the centre of Ro Rochdale. And in the months of June, July, August and September, they were all empty. They were not being used at all. And even if I went at the evenings and the weekends, they weren't used. So, so the first thing I would do, if, if I was a principal, or even better, if I was Secretary of State for Education, <laughs> uh, for further education, would be try and would be try and realise the current assets that are trapped in outmoded buildings, and invest them in digital infrastructure and the workforce capacity and skills. Learning design, for example. Now you know I, I'm an assessor, external assessor at Stanford on the master's degree, learning design with technology. We haven't we haven't even begun to talk about le to learning design. Our learning design is predicated on that industrial revolution stuff of saying. Well, what learning is we bring a load of people together, we get them in a room in a certain time, and, and then you know we talk at them, maybe giving them some work. The whole issue about learning design, we need to invest in learning designers and identify what is it that we want learners to learn, and what's the best way in which they can learn that, and what, what facilitates that? Can, can they learn that online? And if they can, then let's do it. What sort of skills do the teachers need to do? What do they need to be in a room together? Um, sometimes, uh, and then when you've done all that, then you can put together a program of learning, can't you? But until, until you've thought through the, the principles of learning design, you can't begin to address that. Absolutely. And what kind of, I'm fascinated by your point about the buildings. What kind of data exists about those buildings, for example? And what kind of data exists about online capacity um, well, okay. within well, FE? I the, date, the data, let, let me share an anecdote with you. About five years ago, uh, I did a, a, a Adobe Connect virtual conference for Leeds City College. The principal there was a very good friend of mine, Pete Robertson, sadly he died. Uh, but they, they've really moved on Leeds City College. And we started work and I've worked with many colleges where you start a better strategy and everything like that. And I had to do this presentation to like 800 staff, some 400 in a room and 400 in on Adobe Connect. And um, I did my usual stuff. And this one is probably, uh, you know, one cynic in the audience. It's all very well you talking about doing all this, but uh, where are we going to get the money? Where are we going to get the money to do all that? And I turned to my friend, who was the principal, and I said, Peter, how many buildings have we got at Leeds City College? And he turned to his vice principal and he said, uh, Jeff, how many buildings have we got at Leeds City College? And the vice principal turned to the head of estates and said, how many buildings have we got at Leeds City College? So the answer to your question is, nobody knows. So if you don't know the value of what you've got, then how can you possibly think about investing in the value of what you need? So, and, and I know I, I will get some stick about this because you know, you don't sell the silver, you don't sell the family silver. Well, if the family silver is stuck in a drawer and you never use it and the learners need to eat, then let's convert some of those assets into something else, you know? So I'd, I think that that's what I would do if I had the power to do it. It would be realign the whole infrastructure, uh, workforce capability and competence, not entirely away from it. It's, I, don't, I don't fall for this uh, either or situation. You know, the, the people who go for this polarized view, it's usually because they're publishing a book called Teachers or, or Tech or something like that. It, it, it's a case of it's always been teachers plus tech. So how, yes. So how how do we create a blend that's based on what's best for the learners that makes the best value for the money? And uh, you know, and I think you, you've got to look at the context and the culture of further education. But but I, you, you've seen me use this slide before of the the horse pulling a Henry Ford's car. 
try, trying to force new technology into old ways of working is, is just doomed to fail, you know. And the people who will criticize us will say, see, I told you, you know, the Tom Bennett's of the world will say, see, I told you it wouldn't work, but that's because we're not using it in the right way. We're not, we're, we're trying to force the technology into our existing pedagogy. Um, I think we've got to start with the pedagogy. And that's why I've been so critical, and I'm off the Christmas card at the DFE, of, of, I've been so critical of the DFE EdTech strategy because it's more concerned with products and services than it is with people and pedagogy. We've got to start with people and pedagogy. And, and that's then where, we'll... I agree. And that's where the data can be really helpful because we can find data about pedagogy. We can yeah. find data about the people and, and we can add to that yeah. because I think it is about pushing forward on that human front. So I think, you know, it's really interesting, um, Bob, what you're talking about, the complexity of the situations that you're reflecting. I love the story about not knowing the number of buildings, but I actually think that's not unusual. It's I not. think in a lot of institutions, people don't know their own context because they don't know what data there is. And a lot of what you need to do if you're really going to leverage AI valuably in the future is to really understand what you've got already and, and what you know about that and use that to understand more about your key challenges. And then you can start to think about how you can use AI in the analysis of that complex data, but also as you try and tackle that challenge, you know, where would you use AI in further education? to really try and bring about the transformation that the system was set up to do. It's just that now we need a different transformation. Absolutely, absolutely, spot on. And that's I, really I, where we need to go. I, I think there's an enormous amount of potential for uh, AI in further education, but not, not with the data that we've currently got, because yeah. the, the data we're currently collecting is entirely about uh, accountability and accountancy and, you know, uh, attendance you know colleges don't get paid you know if somebody leaves you know in a so six, that's the data in, in a sixth form if your student starts at the beginning the, you get the money that's it in fe if if they get if, if they're not there at certain data collection points and then the, the other data is financial data and then the other data is what achievement well it's assessment not achievement it's what assessment data have we got and and so in a way we're not collecting the data that could be really useful, which is in about assessment and teaching and learning and, and uh, formative assessment. I, I, I'm a judge for the e-assessment awards. And the winner this year was the Welsh Government have put all their key stage three uh, assessments online, their formative assessments online. Really powerful, at scale, you know, I'm at... Now, that's the sort of solutions that we want. We want, and they've used an, They've got an AI foundation in the platform that they've built. That's really interesting. I can see there's a question. I realise we're running out of time, but I can see there's a question um, and from um, Dorothy. Um, how much do college leaders know about the technologies available to them? Do you think? Do you think that within their college, and is there much resistance to new technologies? So that's two questions. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's from Dot, Dot Leposka, yeah. who yeah. I know very well. Uh, and just just to add a context, you say we're running out of time. I've I've got to leave you shortly because I, I'm on another Zoom uh, governor. Well, actually, it's not. It's a Google hang. It's a Google meetings with Oldham College. I'm a governor at Oldham College. I live up here in Manchester. So, uh, ironically, and and that's a good indication. I think uh, we've had five governing body meetings. I've I've chaired four at Northern College now, all online, all using remote. So Dot's question is, what do college leaders, well, I think there's an interesting one. Governors, I think that one of the keys is governors. Now, you know, I'm, I'm a governor, I'm a chair of governors. And I think the, the difficulty is there are some college principals who don't know enough and therefore, and there are some governors who don't know enough. And that combination together is lethal because unless you've got principal, if you've got principals who don't know enough and then sign up to whatever deal with whoever, uh, because they don't quite understand, and then you have a governing body that don't understand the implications of that, 
then you don't have any accountability. So, um, you know, I, I've always tried to, when, when I get invited now, it's less and less now because I'm not bothered and I've got time and I'm getting old. But when I get invited to go out, will you come and work with, will you come and do something with us? The, the precondition for me is I, I need to start, first of all, with your governing body and with your students. If we start with the students, if we start with the governing body, we've got a chance to squeeze in the middle somewhere, you know. Uh, so I think the answer to Dot's question is not enough. Yeah, so they probably don't know that much. And is there much resistance to new technology and, at, amongst leaders and governors, amongst college head principals and governors? Is, are they resistant to technology? Are they welcoming of technology? No, I, I think there was a resistance uh, uh, up until fairly recently. And you know, I, I'm not going to get uh, distracted into discussions about JISC and the, the money that's already been ploughed in there and everything like that, because I think, uh, you, you know, j there's been an awful lot of money trying to raise awareness. And but, but of course, I've been a principal and the driving forces for you are really about achievement and assessment rates, Ofsted inspection and uh, money. And I think your colleague, uh, our ex-colleague, Diana Lorillard, summarised it best of all to say that, you know, we can't really take advantage of the benef full benefits of technology because all the drivers of the education system are, you know, the Ofsteds, the curriculum, the funding and everything like that, don't, don't, aren't subtle enough to understand and appreciate the value that technology can offer. Therefore, nothing within it, it makes it difficult for it to change. Yes. Because yes. all, the, all the drivers are driven by, by other things. So I think there was resistance. But there again, this virus has done it for us. Yeah. That's a great place to stop, Bob. Thank you so much for joining me. Have a great virtual meeting. All right. That's take great. care. Thank you. And, bye, and bye. thank you to everybody else. Bye. See you. Thank you to everybody else for joining us. Thank you for Roland for chairing. I'm just going to remind everybody that next week, not next week, next time. I keep saying next week and it's two weeks. We'll be looking at the next step, which is very much about, so we've collected this data. Now, how do we analyze it? And that will include looking at the kinds of AI modeling techniques that we can use um, to, to analyze the data. Because the, the important point about the AI readiness is that it's about using data science and AI to analyze the data that you have, but also thinking about how you can use AI in the future to try and help you tackle that challenge. And I'm gonna stop there and thank everybody for coming along and thank you, Roland, and see you in two weeks time. Thank you. Oh, and don't forget, there's another session on Thursday if you happen to be a business person uh, as well as an educator uh, with my colleague, Carmel Kent. And I can see Roland's put it in the um, chat. So that's great. Great, thanks very much, everybody. Bye. Thanks, Bob. Right, Take care, everybody. We'll uh, see you next time. I've put the link in the chat as well if you'd like to sign up for future things. Thank you. You can just visit us at uh, our website to sign on as well. I'm going to end the call now. Thanks. <laughs>